very interesting question. So we know that tobacco companies own some of the major vaping brands here in New Zealand. British American Tobacco New Zealand owns the Vuz brand, which is available from around two and a half thousand different retail outlets, according to their website. And internationally, we also know that tobacco companies have been purchasing vape brands. So it's clearly an area of interest and investment for them. Look, I feel like we've missed an opportunity to regulate more effectively. I think, importantly, we've had a strong focus on people who smoke and supporting them to quit. Um, but I think we also need to bear in mind the needs of young people who deserve protection from the aggressive marketing that's targeted them. I think they're certainly a very important influence, but uh, it's difficult to know exactly what's going on because of course we can observe overt marketing and we know that tobacco companies are extremely profitable, so they have the resources and they also have the capacity to change and adapt very quickly. And that's important when a regulatory environment is evolving. But what we don't know is the kind of lobbying that goes on behind the scenes. Uh, so when it comes to ascertaining the biggest influence, we know tobacco companies have very large resources, but what we don't know is how they're deploying those across a range of activities. PR activities almost by definition involve private conversations and lobbying and I think particularly now because we have a regulatory environment that is evolving, uh, we, we would be very surprised if tobacco companies weren't investing heavily in that sort of activity. Well, I think these products have been targeted to appeal to young people. So if we have a look at the physical product itself, these are very slick, sophisticated, technologically appealing, gadgety kinds of devices. So there are a lot of reasons why they've been designed to pique young people's curiosity. We also know that they're very attractive accessories, so they're the, the kind of thing that you would want to have on a table sitting beside you. And we know that those sorts of products are important to young people because they're not only appealing to use, but they say something about who they are as a person. So the products are very, very appealing, and we also know that the e-liquid flavours have been designed to appeal to young people. So these often come in very alluring, eye-catching packaging. They have names that such you know things like unicorns milk that appeal to young people as well so as a package I think that these sorts of products have been designed to target young people Well, I think that the simple answer to that is they were very aggressively marketed. So we saw vaping products across all media platforms. We saw them on television, we saw them in print media, we heard them on the radio, we saw them through sponsorships and event marketing, and of course, they were also on social media, which we know is a very important youth platform. Well, the new vaping laws were important, um, but again, I think the short answer is not as much changed as we might have liked. So the new legislation, of course, removed the advertising. Um, so we no longer see the mass media advertising or the event sponsorship. So that's sponsorships of music festivals and Christmas parties and those sorts of things, which is very important. But what we continue to see is a great deal of marketing occurring on social media platforms. Now, we know that those platforms have wide youth reach, uh, so not having dealt with that is a major limitation to the legislation. Yeah, I think uh, the new laws also differentiated between retail outlets. So they established specialist vape stores and generic retail outlets. Specialist vape stores can sell the full panoply of flavours. Generic retailers are limited to selling tobacco, menthol and mint flavours. That was an important distinction, but in my view, 
These small convenience stores shouldn't be selling vaping products. Um, they certainly shouldn't be on full display. We now have vape power walls behind counters. So young people see these products as soon as they walk into stores. So I think it was important to establish this distinction, but it should have gone further and not allowed the products to be sold in convenience stores. I also think that that would uh, do a better service to people who smoke because they need high quality advice on making that complex transition from smoking to vaping and they're very unlikely to get that from specialist, uh, from convenience stores. I think uh, because we know that social media is such an important platform, there's a great deal of online marketing. So many vape stores have online portals where people can make purchases. They have poor age verification. So that means that young people can go on and effectively click a button to say that they're aged 18 or over. I think we need to have much stronger age verification processes so that we're protecting young people under the age of 18. Um, well, the event sponsorship is, is no longer allowed, but previously, prior to the legislation, so they sponsored activities like Rhythm and Vines and Rhythm and Alps, and it's extraordinary what they had there. So they'd have photo booths, they'd have lounges, they sponsored parties, and again, these would have facilities for people to trial the products. There would be very heavy branding, so that the brand became very cleverly and carefully integrated with the entire event. It became part of the experience and the good feeling that people had while they were attending these events. Uh, so the legislation um, bans the, the advertising of, of vaping products. So it includes them under the Smoke Free Environments Act now. But social media is poorly regulated and poorly monitored. So these large companies have now transferred and intensified their marketing via social media. So we've um, done some studies looking at social media promotions post-legislation. We've identified a lot of activity going on. We see giveaways, we see referrals among young people, we see loyalty programs, and all of these are initiatives that are designed to maintain the appeal and reach of vaping products. I think it's certainly true that some specialist vape stores offer people who smoke good advice that helps them to transition from smoking to vaping. And I think we do need to recognise that for some people who have been smoking for many years and unable to quit using traditional approaches, vaping has been a harm reduction alternative that's worked. Um, so I think that that is an important argument to, to bear in mind. But at the same time, we know that young people who have never smoked have been taking up vaping. Uh, and that's, of course, the, the major problem that we need to deal with now. Yes, as I've said before, I, I think that we shouldn't be selling um, these products through convenience stores, and that includes corner dairies. What we're now seeing is because they've been limited to selling tobacco, menthol and mint flavours, a kind of a store within a store evolution process occurring where dairies are subdividing their premises, they're retaining the traditional convenience store, but at the same time they're establishing a new specialist vape store. So this is really concerning because many of these stores, as we know, are located in residential areas, they're part of family communities, and they're also often adjacent to schools and other areas that young people go to. So yesterday, for example, I was looking at a map um, with Hamilton Girls High School and there were six vape stores that were located within an easy walk of the high school. And we need to say, how did we let this happen? And this is uh, just inviting young people to take up vaping.
Unfortunately, because, well, fortunately, I suppose smoking was at a very low level, so very few young people smoke. Um, so when they take up vaping, it's not replacing smoking because so few of them are, are actually smoking. Instead, it's increasing the proportion of young people who are using nicotine. And the work that we've done shows that the proportion of young people using nicotine has grown rapidly as a consequence of vaping. Yes, I think we've spent a lot of time thinking about the physical risks of vaping without really considering the psychological burden that, that vaping imposes on young people. And it seems to me deeply ironic that young people take up something like vaping because they see it as a symbol of independence and freedom, an assertion of who they are or who they want to be. And yet what it does is to compromise that freedom because that's what dependence means. So they have to organise their day and structure it around vaping. They have to think about when they're going to get their next dose. They may have to absent themselves from social occasions. Sometimes we have reports of young people who even have to get up in the night to vape because they're craving nicotine. So I think we need to spend much more time thinking about the psychological burden vaping imposes. I used to think that we needed to strike a balance between people who smoke and people who've never smoked, typically young people. But I, more and more I've been thinking that that's actually a false dichotomy. I actually think that we could better serve people who smoke if we limit the supply of these products to specialist vape stores where they can get high quality advice. These stores are R18, so young people wouldn't be able to access them. So I actually think that it's possible to have a strategy that's not striking a balance, but that's actually a win-win in serving both groups more effectively. It's probably less about big tobacco and more about regulating the retailing. So I think vape products, they're so available and measures that we really need are proximity and density measures. So I think if we're going to stop youth vaping, we shouldn't be allowing vaping products to be so widely available and they shouldn't be sold by people who are not experts in the products themselves. So I think we need proximity and density measures. We shouldn't allow the congregation of vaping stores and they shouldn't be allowed to be close to high schools. So for me that's probably the single biggest step that we could be taking to ensure that young people in particular have better protection while still ensuring that people who smoke have reasonable access to specialist advice from these stores. I'm sure it is. I mean, vape products, um, or certainly some of the disposable items that are available, much cheaper for young people than buying a packet of cigarettes. We don't have an, any excise tax on vaping products because they're not classified as tobacco products, so they don't attract the annual excise tax increase that, that used to be in place. Um, and so they, they are a cheap alternative. And I think um, while it's important to make them accessible to people who smoke, uh, we should be thinking in the future about um, tax as a possible mechanism to reduce youth uptake. Look, I think we have from the government this really bold and innovative action plan to help us get to Smoke Free 2025. One of the core components of that plan is a smoke free generation. But we haven't taken the next step. I think why are we not thinking about a tobacco free generation? So the smoke free generation focuses on combusted tobacco products, but we could be thinking about a generation of young people who are not burdened by nicotine dependence. Um, so that would be a wonderful thing for the government to be thinking about as part of the um, Smoke Free 2025 goal.